Okay, well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? This lovely 11 a.m. on a Wednesday morning when it's chilly, but not snowing, not raining, and actually kind of nice. Because I'm prejudging the question ever so slightly there, aren't I, by saying, I think it's a lovely day. Hopefully you agree. I see some folks saying good morning in the chat, so that is lovely. And I see we've got 32 concurrent viewers at the moment. Um, ooh, down to 24, up to 30. Yeah, all over the place. I'm kind of hoping that part of the reason why we don't have a huge number of viewers online is because a number of you are gathered in Ian 2006, or maybe a number of you are in Ian 4020, um, and possibly multiple people in the same place. So if anybody, <coughs> if there are a bunch of people in Ian 2006, and do shout out in the chat. Um, if you're in Ian 2006, do also keep your laptop open or your tablet or what have you because we are still going to be doing top hat questions and so you'll want to be able to interact with those even if you don't have to watch the video on the screen okay at least one person is in a study space i wonder if anybody's in ian 2006 i certainly hope so because otherwise if we went from 90 viewers down to 35 then that would be a problem if we don't have a whole bunch of people in one place Hmm. Don't see anything. Anybody in 2006? Some typing that's happening. That's good. Okay. All right. At least one person is in 2006, so that's good. All right. Let us start the morning right with Wheaties. No, not with Wheaties. Let's start the morning with a top hat question. So let me ask you this. So remember, actually I'll put my face away there for a second. Remember we were looking at flow charts last time as we were thinking about flow control and we were thinking about our ability to trace digitally, ha 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 ha. Um, we we're able to digitally trace through a flow chart and figure out how a program would behave. So here is the same flow chart that I showed you about how term three promotion stuff works. Eng1 promotion stuff we're going to do in exercise three, but term three promotion stuff. Here we have this flow chart. Now imagine that a student has these five marks in the course, or sorry, in their five technical courses in term three, 82, 71, 48, 65, and 55, and they've never failed a term before. So look at this flow chart, trace through, and figure out what their result is going to be. Uh, I see someone says that uh, in 2006 is a bit far away from their current, oh, sorry, I shouldn't block that, is a bit far away from their 10 o'clock lecture. Yeah, we have to get used to this whole moving between lecture theaters thing again, don't we? There's a, a sort of ingrained natural desire in my body when I get to the end of a 50 minute lecture I feel like I'm really antsy and I have to go because even though it was like 20 years ago that I was doing undergrad oh my goodness I can't believe yeah even though it was a little less than 20 years ago that I was doing my undergrad I still feel antsy because I have to get up and like go over to chemistry physics in the next 10 minutes or something and perhaps watching lectures online, we don't have that same ingrained natural sense of got to get up and got to go to the next thing. But I guess we'll get there. Oh, so people saying can't see the question. Yes, sorry, I can definitely scroll up. So imagine that a student has the following marks, 82, 71, 48, 65, and 55. In fact, I'll type that into the chat. 82, 71, 48, 65, 55. And now if anybody is not watching the lecture, but they're seeing messages fly by in the chat, they're going to be really confused what that's all about. Right, and now I'll scroll back down so that people can see the flowchart again. So the numbers are in the chat, and the flowchart is in the lecture video. All right, we're getting lots of answers here. I'll just give us just a little bit more time for anyone else who hasn't finished answering yet. All right, now let's go ahead and close this out in five, four, 
three, two, one, and stop. There we go. And let's take a look at the responses. Okay, so lots of folks said PRP. So is that correct? So we have these marks 82, 71, 48, 65, and 55. So if we trace through this flow chart, first of all, we complete the term, good. Now we check, is the average greater than or equal to 60? So you tell me, what is the average of these five numbers? Oh, there's a question in the chat about uh, a question about the second exercise. If you sent me an email, I have not had a chance to respond to many 10, 20 emails over the last day or two, uh, but I will, if you've already emailed me and I haven't responded, I will reply to you. Okay, so we've got 64.2 or 62 or 64. And so that is indeed above 60. Since that's above 60, the average is above 60, we'll follow this yes arrow. And then the question is, did the student pass all their courses? In this case, because they had a 48, sadly, they did not pass all their courses. Nope. But were all the course grades above 40? Well, yes, they were. So the answer is the student gets a PRP, which stands for probationary promotion, and they get to write some re-exams, and if they pass the re-exams, then they will just pass the term and go on with their class. Otherwise, they'll have to go back and possibly repeat the semester. And so most people had the right answer. And answering a question to do with a flowchart like this is kind of just a matter of following through the logic of the flowchart. And a flowchart is therefore something that is really handy because we can represent complex decisions by breaking them down into very, very simple decisions. And we want to do that because computers can't do complex things. They can do simple things. They can do simple things very fast and very repetitively, but they don't do complex. We have to break down the complex into simple things for the computer. Um, if you didn't get an answer in to that question, it will be made available as a piece of top hat homework. Okay, good. So we've been talking about things like if statements, which in Python, we write the keyword if, and then a condition. So tell me, what's a keyword again? What is a keyword? Go ahead and type in the chat, someone. People are saying, hmm. Some people are saying, what is a keyword? I bet you other people are saying, I think I know what it is, but I'm not sure that I want to type it in the chat. Yeah, that's okay. You can type wrong answers into the chat, and I'm not going to think any of the less of you because we're all, we're all learning stuff here. Okay, so uh, people are asking, can you resubmit? Yeah, I think when you open, when I open it as homework, I think you'd be able to resubmit if you like miscalculated something. Right, so a keyword is something that kind of looks like it ought to be an identifier. It has alphabetical characters in it. So if here and else there, I mean, those look like words. They don't have spaces in them. They have just letters in them. So that could be a valid identifier, except for the fact that it is reserved by the language. The language says that would be a nice identifier, except no. I say you're not allowed to use that as an identifier. So remember, when we try to type such a thing into Thani, I can say x equals three. I can say hello is equal to what a lovely day. I can use underscores and things. So if I wanted to have a much longer greeting, equals sup and I could even have numbers in an identifier such as my favorite uh, for I, I don't know my favorite 42 is 42. I don't always use the number 42, but when I do, I use 42. So we can have lots and lots of things in an identifier, but if I try to create a variable called if, you're going to see that that is not valid syntax. You can't use a keyword as an identifier. So keywords in this case include if, and they also include else. And we're gonna see another new keyword today. 
So we have keywords and we also have indentation. So we have an if keyword followed by a condition. And what does a condition need to evaluate to? Oh, and someone pointed out on keyword that it's a different color. It does something special. Yeah, so you would notice when I'm typing things into Thani here, and it's true when you use Visual Studio Code or some other IDE as well, when I type ELS, you see it's just black. It's the same color as any other text on a white background. Or if you have a different theme, maybe it's like a light gray on a black background or something. There are lots of different themes you can have. When I type this E, all of a sudden the word changes color. And that is because the IDE that I'm using, Thani in this case, is clever enough to identify all the keywords and change them to a different color. You'll also observe this syntax highlighting up here that makes the strings green and it makes the print and float functions purple and it makes the comments red. Now in a Python file, there's nothing in the file that actually indicates this next little bit of stuff should be red or green or purple or orange. No, this syntax highlighting is added by the tool that we use to view the Python file. If you were to take this file and open it in a plain text editor, so like Notepad on Windows or text edit on Mac OS, you would see it's just words. They're, that coloring, that highlighting doesn't actually exist in the file. That is just something that we add on top in order to make it easier to look at. It's sort of like staining something that you look at on a under a microscope. So when you put a specimen on a slide, you might put a stain on it that will add color to certain aspects of a cell or something. Well, it's not that those aspects of the cell were really purple in the first place. It's just we add a dye that where the purple dye binds more strongly to some things and other things, just so we can see the structure a little more easily. And that's how syntax highlighting is working here as well. So excellent point. It does get, a keyword does get highlighted in a different color from the rest of the text. Now, uh, to get back to the question, so I said if condition and condition is any expression that evaluates indeed, as people said in the chat, to a Boolean value, to true or to false. So that means that, for example, in the lab yesterday, I saw students writing things like if the light value is less than 400, then I want to do something. So light was I'm just going to initialize it with a number here because I don't actually have a Grove kit attached, but you might have done an analog reading, stored it in a variable, and now we can say things like if light is less than 400, then do some stuff. Where that stuff is one or more Python statements. So for example, we could print something. Um, it's a bit dark in here, eh? So if, and then a condition, and then a colon. And the colon is important. It indicates to the Python interpreter, we are now done with the condition. And if you leave that colon out, you're gonna see a syntax error. Remember, the interpreter is pickier than your pickiest grammar teacher you've ever had. But that pickiness allows us to build this pretty expressive synthetic language. So if, condition, colon, statements which are indented and I can have more than one in here. Why don't you turn on a light? There we go, so I can have one statement or multiple statements or whatever. After the if condition colon and some statements, then we can optionally have, we saw an else clause. So if the condition is true, we will go off in this direction and do this stuff. If the condition is false, we'll go off in this direction, do some other stuff. And in this case, I'll say print what a lovely bit of light in here. And this time, let's say I only make one statement. Okay, so we've got if keyword condition, which evaluates to true or false, colon, some statements. Else, colon, some statements. Someone asked, is 42 a reference to Douglas Adams? Yes, absolutely, it is a reference. Uh, 42 is the answer to the question of life, the universe, and everything. Very good. So, what's going to happen now? What do you think 
this script will print out, well, sorry, this, this statement will print out when I press enter, well, when I press enter again, which will make Python actually interpret the script. So I've said, dear Python, I've finished typing in my if statement, if light is less than 400, blah, 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 else, blah, blah, blah. So what's gonna happen when I press enter? The if stuff, okay? Do we think the if stuff? Or do we think the else stuff? The else part will be executed, right. So we're going to print out what a lovely bit of light in here. Ta-da! So it prints out what a lovely bit of light in here. Good. Okay, let me... Oh, no, no. Can't ask you that. Can't ask you that yet. Okay, we'll be able to ask you this other question in just a minute. Okay, so that's what we did thus far, and I encouraged you to draw a flowchart at home or, or wherever and use that to try to think through how flowcharts work and think through can you make a complex decision, can you break it apart into a bunch of very small decisions where the answer is either yes or no and the question is very simple, something a computer could understand like are these two things the same? Is this thing greater than that thing? For example, so could you draw a flowchart that uses very small decisions? And so we noted the syntax for if statements. Okay, let's think about how to do a little problem. So this is this was actually an assignment question at one point. So in structural structural engineering, and I am not a structural engineer, however, I have colleagues who are and tell me about these things. So in structural engineering, when you are designing a building or something else that has columns in it, it this this value is quite an important value, apparently, the critical buckling stress. And I gather that you don't want the stress in a column to exceed the critical buckling stress because then it could buckle and, I guess, break and stuff. That's the extent of my uh, structural engineering knowledge. What I do know is that this is an important value, and the way we calculate it is with a piecewise function. So we have thus far been doing algebraic types of expressions in which you might assign a value to a variable and then on the right hand side, so on the left hand side, something, then equals, and then on the right hand side, an algebraic expression. If we wanted to have an algebraic, or if we didn't have this piecewise function thing, if the only thing we had to worry about was, sorry, let me just, uh create a new script here. If the only thing we had to worry about was that top half, if FCR was always equal to 0 0.658 to the power of lambda c squared times f of y, then what would that look like? Well, we could create a variable called something like FCR and assign, and assuming that there were existing values already, lambda c and f y, then we could say that FCR is equal to what? Why don't you type in the expression in the chat for what FCR would be equal to? Assuming that we already have variables defined called lambda C and FY, what would it be if we are only looking at this top part and we don't have this piecewise function stuff? Someone said, uh, Accent switch. Oh, yes, yes. That was me doing my terrible attempt at an almost cockney. Okay, so we've got 0 0.58 and then, ha, I suspect what's going on in some of the answers that people are typing in is that the, so you're allowed to make bold text and stuff in the chat. And the way that bold text is indicated is by using asterisk characters around things. So I think some people's things are, some people's responses are coming up in a slightly funny way because they have, uh, they have asterisks that they're using to represent multiplication. So uh, 
Yeah, top hat chat like top hat chat likes to mess up expressions. And so if you type hello and put asterisks around it, it'll make a bold hello, stuff like that. And I think two underscores will make it italics, stuff like that. So what people I think are mostly trying to type is that we would have something that looks like 0 0.658 to the power of something. And that would be to the power of lambda c to the power of two, so lambda c squared, and that times fy. Now, in Python, actually, we can use characters like the Greek letter lambda if we wanted to, but on the other hand, lots of keyboards, unless you are using a Greek keyboard, you probably have a hard time typing that. And we don't really want to write code where people have to do a lot of copying and pasting, so we're probably not going to use the lambda character. So it would just look like this. And so perhaps we could even write a little script in which we say lambda c is equal to, well, let's ask the user, what is lambda c? And we'll take that response, whatever comes back from input, we'll pass that to the float function, convert that to a floating point value, and store it in lambda c. And then fy, we can do the same thing. What is fy? And now we don't have to assume anything. Now we can print the critical buckling stress is... FCR. Okay, so let's run this script and tell me if lambda c is 2 and fy is 379, what is FCR going to be? Just pull out a calculator or use your computer. Oh, somebody's starting to type. Okay, we've got the number 71. Okay, and so the critical buckling stress is 71.04651598, uh, sorry, 7871.84. Or we might interpret, we might present it as 71.0 or 71.05. We probably want to have some specification of how many significant figures, etc. But still, so we can calculate this value. Very good. However, that's not actually the definition of critical buckling stress. Critical buckling stress is calculated differently depending on whether lambda c is less than or equal to 1.5 or greater than 1.5. And this is the difference, so why, or sorry, lambda c represents the slenderness of the column because apparently the way stresses and fractures and things work in a column, it, it, they are different depending on whether the column is really long and skinny or not so skinny and a little bit shorter. So there are different ways of calculating what matters for reasons that I'm sure structural engineers understand very well, but I don't, but that's okay. So we need to compute this FCR value differently depending on lambda c, which means if we were to draw a flow chart for deciding what FCR is, we wouldn't just have a box that says input lambda c, a box that says fy, and a box that says FCR is equal to something. No, instead, we're going to have to have a decision. There's going to be a diamond saying, is lambda c greater than or equal to 1.5? If so, do this, otherwise do something else. So what's that going to look like in Python? So what kind of syntax are we going to have to introduce or what kind of statement are we gonna to have to introduce in order to have this conditional control flow, either calculating FCR this way or that way? Right, so we're gonna need an if statement and in particular, we're gonna need if and we're gonna need the else. So if something, 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 then we are going to calculate FCR this way, else we'll calculate FCR a different way. And that different way is 0 0.877 divided by lambda C 
to the power of 2, and then all of that is times Fy. Question. If I remove the parentheses around lambda c to the power of 2, will that change the meaning or the value that this expression evaluates to? And why or why not? Okay, we've got yeses and nos. Right, more nos than yeses. And the nos are correct. So yes to the nos. <laughs> the reason is that in our order of operations from that table we saw in expressions, exponentiation happens before multiplication and division, which means that this little bit of the expression is going to be evaluated before the rest. That said, sometimes it's kind of nice to put parentheses around things just to be friendly to the people who are going to read your code later and remind them that you know, in this slightly complex expression, you wouldn't want to accidentally misread it the wrong way. So sometimes the parentheses can help, even if they're not strictly necessary. So if something, 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 FCR is calculated this way, otherwise FCR is calculated that way. So what should our condition be? What goes here? If what? Well, um, oh, I'm asking you a question, but you can't actually see the slide. So under what circumstances do we calculate FCR using the 0 0.58, the first part of the piecewise function? When lambda c is less than or equal to 1.5. So let's add that. If lambda c is less than or equal to 1.5. Okay, so if lambda c is less than or equal to 1.5, then our critical buckling stress is this. Otherwise, our critical buckling stress is that. So let's try running this again and giving it the same input. So what is lambda c? 2. What is fy? 379. When I press enter, what will this script print? Okay, so if this were like a test situation, I said, what will this print? I would want you to write out the whole thing. It will print the critical buckling stress is, and then a number. Yeah, someone said else stuff. Yeah, sure, but I, I will actually want you to tell me the number. Come on, we can calculate things. Well, a couple of people did anyway, so let's see what the answer is. And the answer is indeed 83.09, which means for a column with a lambda C value greater than 1.5, it seems like you can get away with a little bit more stress in the column than you can for something with lambda C that is less than 1.5. Again, I don't pretend to be a civil engineer, so I'm not going to tell you for sure what that means about structural design. But if you're interested in that stuff, I'm sure that someone like Dr. Hussein or someone else in the civil department will tell you all about it. Okay, so that's an example of how we can use if statements in order to implement conditional control flow. And for a real engineering application, the things that you're going to learn or the things that you are already learning in this course are not just applicable to computer engineering. We don't teach programming so that we can figure out who should go into computer engineering and who shouldn't. We teach programming because computing is a part of every engineering discipline and every kind of engineer needs to understand something about how computing works. But that said, if you do really enjoy this programming stuff and think it's really cool and really neat and fun and well it, it could be that computer engineering would be a good fit but not necessarily I do um, and at some point in the next month or so I guess I'll be giving a presentation in a different capacity as a chair of the admissions committee about the process by which students get matched to different disciplines in term three, electrical, computer, mechanical, process, ocean naval, architectural, civil. I hope I just named all six of them because otherwise it would be awkward if I left one out. And in that process, one really, really key piece of advice, and this is 
something that doesn't have very much to do with programming specifically, but still, I can't say it enough times, is that you should do something that you are interested in and you should do something that you think you could love because whatever stuff in engineering kind of makes you excited, you want to do more of that stuff because that's going to really drive you to do well and to excel. And and also there will be moments in your program where things are tough and having that intrinsic motivation of saying, no, no, I love this stuff and I'm going to get through it and I can do this will really, really help with things. So do something that you love. If you love programming and you think this is really cool, then maybe consider computer engineering. If you love other things more, you think programming is really, really cool, but you are also really into structures, well, maybe civil engineering is a good choice, etc. Okay. Someone said mechatronics and lots of robot emojis. Beep, bop, boop, bop. Yes. We do have the robotics courses and things I think can be done by mechanical, electrical, and computer students. So in mechatronics, of course, there's a balance between how much mech and how much tronics you do. And the mechatronics program will come at things from, there'll be some course material in in the tronics part, and but a lot of mech. And then there are also a lot of people who work a lot more on the tronics part with a little bit of mech. So there are choices. Okay, so here's another bit of Python syntax. So last time we talked about decisions that could be made where it was one way or the other. It was a yes or a no, a true or a false. We didn't talk about what about when you need to choose among multiple alternatives. So for example, I gave the example last time of if I were writing a piece of software to advise me on what kind of a jacket I would like to wear, I said, is it cold or is it not cold? Well, I mean, that's not really the full range of possibilities, is it? What are different, and maybe you can just type this in the chat, under what circumstances might I want to wear different kinds of coats or not wear a coat at all? What kind of advice might a program give? Okay, so yeah, if it's raining, then I'm going to want my raincoat, which is properly waterproof. Yeah, yeah, it could be snowing. What are some different temperature ranges? Fashion, yeah. Unfortunately, if it's me, then fashion isn't going to enter into it quite as much. I, I'm not a particularly fashionable person, but but that's okay. I... I wear clothes where the colors coordinate at least, so I'm doing okay. And some people are more into fashion, and that's fantastic. More power to you. Right, so if it's under 20 degrees, that matters. If it's under minus 20, that matters. Yeah. Okay, so let us look at some more alternatives. So let me... Okay, so... Let us ask the user a couple of questions. So, rain equals input. Is it raining? Now, if a user is asked, is it raining, what are they likely to type? <laughs> Someone said tornado. Yes, I'm not sure that I have a, a tornado jacket or an earthquake coat, but... Yeah, they're probably going to type a Y or an N, but a Y or an N is a string. So what kind of type would we like to have in our rain variable instead? So let's ask, is it raining? And we'll tell the user, please type Y or N. If they type Y or N, hmm, that might not be terribly helpful to us, but we want a Boolean value. That's right. So let's instead convert rain to something else. Let's say that rain will be equal to, is rain equal to y? What just happened here? Somebody explain to me what this expression on the right-hand side of our assignment statement means. People are typing in the chat, that's good. Ooh, lots of typing, excellent. Right, someone said evaluates to bool, I think they meant. 
Right, exactly equal. So we are checking to see if rain is exactly equal to the letter Y. So in this case, Let's print that value out. I'll run the script and I'll say, is it raining? Why? And then rain will be true. I'll run that again. Is it running? Is it raining? And the answer is no. Okay, rain is false. Uh, there's another little bit of kind of fun syntax that we can use for strings, and we'll get into this a bit more later, but I'll just show it to you now because it can be helpful. Instead of checking to see if rain is exactly equal to y, why don't we check to see if the letter y is in the string rain? Why might we want to do that? Why might we want to do that? Instead of checking to see if rain is exactly equal to y, my, why, why, why might we want to check to see if y is in whatever? Right, because then the user could type. We didn't really want them to type yes, but they did type yes. Whereas before, if we said, is the string exactly equal to y, then yes would evaluate to false, which is kind of weird. Okay, so now we've asked the user, is it raining? And then we can ask for the temperature. What is the temperature in degrees Celsius? Very good. What do we want to do with this? So input is again going to give us a string. User input is always a string. What type would we like to have if we're representing a temperature? Oh, excellent question here. Somebody said is in another keyword. Yes, it is. And you can tell because it changed color when I typed it in. So in is indeed another keyword. When we get to talking more about strings and lists and iterable things, which I think will happen just after the midterm break, when that happens, then we will talk a bit more about that in keyword. Okay, we would like the temperature to be maybe a floating point number, maybe an integer, and there is a reasonable you could make a reasonable case either way. I'm going to go with int because I don't think we're going to build a program to give advice based on if the weather or if the temperature is 18.5 degrees or warmer. That would be a little funny. Okay, so we're going to ask the user, is it raining? And we're going to ask them, what is the temperature? So what is the first thing that I, I'm going to say that the first thing I want to know, if it's raining, and in fact, I'm going to change this to raining because it makes more sense to me to say if raining as opposed to if rain, but you, your mileage may vary. So if it's raining, then I want to say wear your raincoat. Okay. Then we might want to check if it's really cold, like if the temperature is less than minus 20, wear then your winter coat with the liner, linear, <laughs> with the liner. Then we might want to check, well, what if the temperature is not less than minus 20, but it's just less than zero? Well, in that case, I'm gonna say, wear the winter coat without your liner. What if the temperature is just less than 10? Maybe wear a jacket. If the temperature is less than 20, maybe I'll just say wear long sleeves. And if the temperature, and otherwise, wear short sleeves. Okay, so we're checking to see if it's raining, we want to wear the raincoat. If it's less than minus 20, we want to wear the winter coat with a liner. Less than negative zero. If it's less than zero, I want to wear the winter coat probably without the liner. If it's less than 10, just wear a jacket. If it's less than 20, wear long sleeves, and otherwise wear short sleeves. What's the problem with this code? And there's another thing that I'll ask you to do on things like the midterm exam, which, by the way, we have now confirmed will be at 7 p.m. on February the 15th. And a seating plan will be released hopefully later today. So that has now been confirmed. Right. The problem is if 
somebody input something less than minus 20, that will exemplify the problem. So let us run this in debug mode. So is it raining? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say it's not raining. And then what is the temperature? And I'm going to say the temperature is minus 25. Brr, that's pretty cold. So first we evaluate, is it raining? So we step into this, if raining. How do we know if it's raining? Well, we look inside our little box of variables and we see that raining contains false. So if false, well, if something is false, we don't do the stuff inside of that clause. If the temperature is less than minus 20. So is temperature less than minus 20? How do we know what the temperature is? We look in the box. In the box, it says minus 25. So Oops, I clicked step over instead of step in, sorry. Anyway, so it would then evaluate if minus 25 is less than minus 20, that would evaluate to true. And so if true, do this. So we're going to print out wear winter coat with liner. Then we check if the temperature is less than zero. Well, minus 25 is less than zero, so if true, so we're going to print out that too. Huh. And then this one. And then this one too. So we're going to say you should wear your winter coat with a liner, without a liner, and a jacket, and long sleeves. Now, if you're not used to minus 25, maybe that sounds like good advice, but it's hard to wear my winter coat both with and without the liner. That seems kind of difficult. So very often, we want to be able to choose among multiple mutually exclusive alternatives. For example, in the oh no, in the question that I asked you in Top Hat, where we had where I was getting you to trace your finger through the different possibilities for passing or not passing term three, you could go this way, or you could go that way, or you could go that way. There are a bunch of different possible decisions that you could make, but you only end up in one place. When we want to have that kind of a decision, choosing from a number of options in Python, there's one little bit of extra syntax that I didn't show you last time, which is another keyword called elif. So if a condition is true, do some stuff. And then instead of going straight to the else, we can have another possibility, which is elif. El, which is short for else if. Else if this condition is true, do some other stuff. And if that's not true, then else if this condition is true, then do some other stuff. So in our example here, all of these intermediate ifs, we would change to elif, which means when we have if, elif, 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 else, we will execute the statements in exactly one of these alternatives. So if this condition is true, and we go into here, we're not even going to bother evaluating any of the other conditions. If we check this condition and it's false, and we check this condition and it's false, then we'll check the next condition. We'll keep checking conditions until we find one that is true. So let's run this script again. And let's say here that I say it is raining, and it is five degrees outside. Now, first of all, you notice that Thani is highlighting this entire if statement, if, elif, 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 all the way down to the else. Let's run it one step at a time. So is it raining? Yes, it is raining. So the answer is true. So if true, we will print wear your raincoat, and then we're all done. We skip right to the end of the script. I hope you have enjoyed my advice. Let's try running this again and say that this time it is not raining and the temperature is minus 10. So again, we're going to step into, there's this big if statement and there's all these different elements in it and we are gonna step through it one step at a time so first, if raining, how do we know whether or not it's raining? Well, it's a variable. So we look at what's in memory. We look in the box and it says false. If false, so we don't do that. Then we're gonna check the next condition. If temp is less than negative 20. 
What's in temp? Well, let's look in the memory. Memory says it's minus 10. So is minus 10 less than minus 20? It is not. Therefore, this evaluates to false. So we don't execute those statements. So I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. Next, we check the next condition, if temp is less than zero. If minus 10 is less than zero, well, this is true. So we will execute this statement, and then we're done with that if statement. We don't even check any of the other conditions. We skip right to the end, and then finally print, I hope you enjoyed my advice. So the elif syntax allows us to choose from mutually exclusive possibilities. When we only want, it's either this, or that, or that, or that, or that, or that, but it can't be more than one of them, then we can use elif. Someone says we used elif in the lab. Okay, cool. Could you do two ifs on top instead of one? So if I wanted to, I could have an if statement here that's like if, and then another if statement, which is if and elif, and then I, one that is if, elif, elif, else. And these are all separate if statements. So I can have some stuff here and some stuff there and some stuff there. But if I had, for example, if something else print, ah, if it is raining meatballs, for example, then this would be one, I'm sorry, this would be one if statement, and this would be a whole separate if statement, which means if I asked you how many if statements are in this program, the answer would be two. Here's one of them, and here's the other one. Good question. Okay. Uh, let's see, other questions. What if it's raining and it's minus seven? So if it is raining, then we walk through until the first condition that we meet, which evaluates to true. So if it is raining, and so let's try that. So first of all, I mean, it'd be a little unusual for it to be raining and minus seven, but I guess it certainly could be raining and like minus one. That wouldn't be very unusual. Um, so we'll step through. So if it's raining, then we look at the variable raining, it contains true. So if it's raining, then true. So we run that first statement and then we skip all the other conditions. So we will only execute one of all the possibilities. Good question. Okay. When someone says, when I tried to calculate the average for exercise three, it would add up like one plus one equals 11. So that is probably because if you had a string one plus a string one, well, we can add strings together and it looks like one, one. It's kind of like John plus Anderson. Well, those strings can be stuck together and make John Anderson. So that probably means that you didn't convert a string to a number somewhere. Question, is there a way to make a bool statement that checks if multiple variables are less than some number? So, not as one statement, or not as one kind of simple expression, but we can make expressions that are as complicated as we like. So for example, we have comparators that we can use to compare numbers, but also we have logical operators. So we could say, if it is raining and the temperature is greater than minus five, and it's also snowing, and uh, it is sunny, because weather's weird sometimes. If all of those are true, then I want to do something. So we can use expressions like that. We can use logical combinations of logical expressions. So, good question. Now, let me ask you a question. One good question deserves another. Here's a top hat question. What will this Python script print when the user enters the string two zero?
Let's see, there's a question in the meantime that I can answer. Uh, in the top hat question about valid identifiers, the answer says that Ola is a valid identifier. Is that right? No, uh, that's the one that I had to go back and fix, and I just haven't actually fixed it yet. Sorry. Let me make a note for myself here. Fix valid identifiers question. Um, there's also a question, when do you plan on releasing exercise three on grade scope? I almost got it pushed, pushed to grade scope before the lecture started, but, but not quite. So hopefully not long after, well, today anyway. And by the way, uh, for the question about the valid identifiers, the reason why Ola is not a valid identifier is not because of the H or the O or the L or the A. It's because I included punctuation in it. And you can't have punctuation in an identifier. Okay, so let's see. We have lots of answers. Hopefully we're almost done here. I'm going to close this out in just a few seconds. Maybe in like five. Four, three, two, one, and close. Okay, and so we had responses. Okay, we had some different responses. So if the user types in two zero, then in this script, that will get converted into the number 20, which gets stored in X, which means that X is indeed greater than or equal to 17. So we will print foo, and then X will be assigned a new value. It will be assigned whatever is in X, which is 20 divided by two. So X will now be assigned the value 10. We, after this uh, since this express since this condition evaluated to true, we're now done with this if statement. So then we continue executing, and we go to the next if statement. And the next if statement we check is x greater than 15. Well, we're no longer working with the original value of x, which was 20. We're working with this new value of x, which is 10, and that is not greater than 15, which means that we are going to print wibble. So the answer, the correct answer is we are going to print both foo and wibble. So if we type this in, uh, actually, no, I'm not going to type this in now because we're over time. Um, you should type this in, in Thani, and use the debugger mode to step through one step at a time and look at exactly why that is the case. Similarly, just because we are kind of out of time, there, is, there are a couple of exercises that would be good to do. So one would be to convert a numeric mark to a letter grade. So prompt the user, say, type in your mark, where that mark is a number between 0 and 100, and then print out what that letter grade is. Is it an A, a B, a C, etc.? And when we come back together, we'll talk about this little note. Don't worry about that for now. And another exercise that I suggest could be kind of fun is... If someone types in a year, then you tell them what the best song of that decade was. That would be another kind of useful exercise. So do those things independently. Well, I mean, do them not in class and not in the lab, but you can do them together. They're just exercises. You can work on it together, help each other learn, etc. And then we can talk about some of those results next time because we are now out of time. So if there are any final questions, I might answer those, but otherwise, I guess we will call it a day. Don't see anything coming in, so I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day.